I have a completely unscientific impression that uh, the amount of physics funding is wildly disproportionately absorbed by quantum physics to, to a greater extent and, and cosmology to a smaller extent at the expense of everything in the middle that you're so fascinated by and you've made us fascinated by. Is that true? And if so, no, it's, is there anything it's not we can do about the money it? that is sucked up by CERN, it's the publicity. Um, there's a difference. So there is actually a lot of applied physics research going on, and I don't know the exact numbers. It's quite hard to judge because contributions to things like CERN are not always separated out as chunks of money because you employ academics who work there, which are paid for out of university budgets and all that kind of thing. So there is, there is actually... Uh, we would always like more, right? But I think that... The, the, the sort of what are seen as the glamour projects, and, and that's not entirely a fair phrase. Um, they pay for themselves in, in two ways, I think. One is that um, they advance knowledge, which is a good thing. You don't know what's going to be useful until afterwards, so it's always worth finding out. The other thing is that, um, and you don't know, you know, things are useful afterwards. The other thing is that the job of inspiration that they do genuinely matters. I mean, there is, if you, I, I go around interviewing a lot of scientists for the telly stuff, right? And then, you know, I, I you know, you, you talk to people and the, well, I ask why people got into science. There's an entire generation who have the same answer and it's the moon landings, right? So you can argue about what came out of the moon landings from a technical scientific point of view, you know, it's been a few years now since anyone last stood on the moon. It might not, it's, you know, it's going to happen again in the next few years, but the value to science, even though the science itself, maybe you could have a debate about, but the job of inspiration, that, that is extremely valuable. So I think that when you look at the money that goes to things like CERN um, and the LH and LIGO, you know, LISA, which is going to be the next version, so the gravitational wave detection, um, I think the, the weight of that, the, there is, first of all, the curiosity. Humans are an exploring species, and curiosity-driven science matters, because if we give up on that, we give up on being human. If we give up on curiosity, we're, not, we're just automatons. Um, but also, it, you know, it, it, the symbolic commitment to scientific exploration that that represents matters a lot. So... It, it is, it's always difficult. There is always this push between pure science and applied science. And it isn't just uh, in big things like CERN. There's plenty of research that's going on where someone's just gone, oh, that's interesting. Those are the fun bits, right? We find something out we're not supposed to find out uh, or that wasn't part of what we thought we were doing. You just go, oh, I'm just going to investigate that for a bit. And sometimes it goes somewhere and sometimes it doesn't. But you have to allow that. And so I think as part of a you know, sort of whole commitment to science, it's probably about right. But it's, it's almost impossible. It's very difficult to come up with exact numbers. Uh, and the other thing is that if it acts as a training system for scientists who then go on and do other things, that's also useful. It's not a reason to build a big, big tunnel under Geneva. But, you know, it's a system. The point is it's an ecosystem with lots of different parts. And you can't... You have to make decisions, but I don't think you can squabble too much because you don't want just applied science. That's really important. You have to... You have to let science do the thing it does best, which is find out things it didn't know were there. Yeah. Right. Any more for any more? Oh. We've got one up the top. Yes. Someone's at the top. Over there. OK, yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, your title is, We Need to Talk About Physics. So I'm going to expand. My question will expand on that a little bit. Uh, physics is mainly funded by the weapons industry, which means that the brightest and greatest minds of our generation across the world have to get involved in the industry of murder to try and get ahead or proper funding or be recognised in the community of other physics. Uh, what's your view on this and how do you think this should be ended? So it is not the case that most money in physics goes on defence. I will contest your assertion there. There is a huge amount of um, physics research, and defence spending is high, but defence spending on research is a relatively small fraction of the pie. And most scientists go through their careers without ever touching the defence industry. Um, not from my experiences. Thank you. 
so, so I think science itself is apolitical, which is a debate which is ongoing at the moment. And I think that science should stand up for being allowed to be science. But the things that it's used for are... There's a, there's a difference between knowing something exists and what people do with it. And, you know, it's something that, you know, sort of the uh, Pugwash Society fought with in the 70s and 80s. A lot of the scientists who had been part of the... who'd worked at Los Alamos on the Manhattan Project grappled with what it means to be a scientist when someone uses that science for something that you don't like. And I think there has to be a separation between this is what we know about the world, and this is what we do with it. And scientists absolutely have a role to play in that first one. And then society has to have a voice in the second one. Um, but it's like Pandora's box. If you find something out, you found it out. And the only thing, if you don't like what someone is doing with it, is finding more things out. I think, you know, it's, you can't stop science because you don't like some parts of it. And quite a lot of what comes out of the defense industry, I've been funded by the Office of Naval Research in America, and what they were funding me to do was study bubbles in the ocean, which had absolutely no impact on any defense, anything. They just, you know, for funding broad areas of science, because they wanted to make sure someone was doing them. And they will take, they might use a tiny bit of that science. So, but most scientists don't, don't come anywhere near the defense industry. Okay, right. More questions. Someone got a happy question. <laughs> Down here, yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you about your graph of, of time versus size. Oh, yeah. And you showed in one quarter of that graph was quantum mechanics, which is mm -hmm. the science at the very small. And it's, it's one of the great foundations of modern physics. And in the other corner, you had cosmology which is based on relativity, which is another one of the great um, foundations of, of modern physics. And so my question is, do you think there are reasons to think that there will ever be a big idea that describes this area in the middle that you've been talking about, that describes this area of complexity? Or do you think there are good reasons why we will never have a big idea like quantum mechanics and relativity for what you've been talking about? So if you talk to um, someone who studies the early universe or particles about types of physics, they will almost always say, that applied physics, I couldn't do that, it's far too hard. One of the reasons for the focus on those two areas is elegance, is that humans like a story and an elegant pattern. And there's this, like, we've got pattern-fitting minds, and we want to go, oh, that clicks into place there. So the, the, the history of those areas of physics is the history of people looking for an elegant solution. So... I interpret your question as being, do you think there will be an elegant solution for complex systems? And I think the answer is no, and that's the joy of them, is that um, the, there may well be broad guiding principles, but science in the middle has been held back by people desperate to find a nice tidy pattern when life doesn't quite work like that. Um, and physicists are only just getting to grips with statistics, to be honest with you, on the grand scheme of things. Um, the geneticists got there far earlier, because they've obviously got messy data, and I've definitely seen research, lines of research held back by the desperation to find a, a li some points on a line, you, can put, you know, put line through. So I, I think that our understanding of complex phenomena will improve, but I think it's possible that we won't be able to say, and here is the simple theory that covers the whole thing. And I'm all right with that, because I'm more interested in the way that the world actually works than in it being pretty. And the search for elegance is partly that it's worked very well, but it's also partly this human pattern fitting. If it's, if it's simple and you, you know, it just must be right. There's this human thing going, we just want a pattern. We just want everything to fall into place. And that's great when it works. But the fact that we want it doesn't mean it actually applies to the science we do. So I think it's possible that there may not be. But it doesn't mean we won't understand a lot. It just means that whatever we do understand may not be elegant. And I, yeah, that's all right. Life's like that, right? They didn't want to accept um, um, uh, you know, uncertainty principles and things back in the 1920s, and now we've got to deal with the lack of elegance. <laughs> Somewhere. 
Yeah, they're playing pass the parcel up there. You mentioned um, tapping a teacup yeah. around the rim. I was just wondering about a coffee mug on the bottom because I was making a coffee about um, two weeks ago or so, and I noticed when I, I'd it started doing a, like a scale t on the bottom, and then I sort of stirred it again, particularly fast, and I found it did the scale again, but a slight, a slightly and different. And were you scale. using instant coffee? Um, Yes, I was. Yeah. And so I, uh, that's not a snobbish question. That's relevant scientifically. So what you, so what I could do, what I should do at this point is say, uh, you know, go and experiment. The, what you're looking at is something called the hot chocolate effect, because those of us that drink hot chocolate, it's more commonly noticed in hot chocolate, or it was first noticed. Um, what it is, so when you mix granules into a uh, hot liquid, the granules, the little sort of cavities in the granules, basically take down bubbles with them, little bu bubbles of air. And when you stir it all up, you stir those bubbles into the um, mug. And what that does is it reduces the sound speed. And the reason that matters is that when you tap the bottom of the mug, what you set up is a standing wave. You set up a few things, but the major um, oscillation is a standing wave between the bottom of the mug and the free surface at the top. So it's a quarter wave. So it's basically a fixed pattern of a fixed size. Um, so its, it's wavelength is fixed but its frequency depends on the sound speed. So when you've got lots of bubbles in the liquid, there's this thing called Wood's equation, which, which shows you how the sound speed drops, because bubbles are squishy, and liquid water is not very squishy. So because the sound speed dropped when there's bubbles in it, the uh, frequency drops. So that's when you start tapping. And then the bubbles start to rise to the top as you keep tapping on the bottom. And so the sound speed goes up, so the pitch goes up. So it's, it's very easy to demonstrate. Hitting it on the bottom is the best way of doing it. You, the, there are really a lot of things you can do with teacups. Um, <laughs> but you get the cleanest sound for this particular standing wave. Now, the people who are going around with the microphones, we haven't had any questions from women. So I challenge the women in the audience to ask a question. Also, anyone who is on the younger end of things, there have been fewer of those. Uh, um, this is sort of unrelated to all the other questions that have been happening, but um, when you pour a cup of water and it sort of sticks to the side as you go down, why does that happen? So you mean on the inside of the glass or the, the, um, not the spout of the thing you're pouring from? Well, as it goes out, so if you're pouring it and then it sort of sticks to the... Oh, yeah, sticks underneath. Um, that's all to do with surface forces and surface tension. So if you're pouring something and it, it does that annoying thing where you think it should just come out that way and it sort of does this dribble all over the countertop thing. Um, it's because water is fundamentally sticky. And especially if you're pouring slowly, if you're pouring really quickly, the inertia of the moving liquid will just carry it forward. And, and no sticky force here will be enough to stop it. But if you pour it very slowly, the, the inertia is of a similar magnitude to the surface adhesion forces that are sticking the liquid to the side, and so they will tend to stick and crawl around, and it only takes a little bit of a bend, and then they've gone off in the wrong direction. So it's, it's because water is very sticky, um, and the faster you pour, the more confidence you have to just pour it, the more momentum it's got, the less that will matter. But it still amazes me that um, I bought a, I broke a teapot recently, so I bought a new teapot, and um, I bought a reasonably expensive teapot, you know, on the scale of what I would spend on a teapot, and it wouldn't pour properly. I was like, how? People in this country have been making teapots for a long time. How is anybody allowed to sell a, a teapot that still does that? And there's two things you can do to prevent it. You can muck about with the shape of the ceramic, if it's whatever it is, um, just to make it to make it hard, to make the corner quite sharp so it's hard for the liquid to stick. The other thing is you can, you can coat it in something which, liquid, which water doesn't stick to very well, and then it just slides off. There's quite a lot of science that goes into teapots. Um, I uh, work in the same department as Mark Miodovnik at uh, UCL, who is very familiar to anyone who spends a lot of time at the Royal Institution. And um, he sets a fourth year project on teapot design for precisely this reason. And I walked in um, quite soon after I joined the department. I had an office that was next to the room where they sat exams. And there was a sign on the door one day, and it said, quiet, please, teapot exam. <laughs> Uh, anyway, yes, right. Where else have we got questions? Gallery left. Up here. Yeah. Okay. Up there, yeah. right. Thanks very much. We'll be thinking a lot more with every little thing now after this enlightening talk. But my question is slightly unrelated. Um, I mean, you've, you are, you've been a career, you've been into physics for so long. Have you seen a change in the gender imbalance 
in physics. Right. We are good at cheerful questions, you lot, aren't you? <laughs> um, so, there has been... Physics is still predominantly male. But that is, has a, that's less about what's coming in, I think. So the numbers coming in have changed. Um, I think that things are getting better, but the thing that takes longest to change is the culture of a, of a workplace. And so it's definitely getting better. It's getting better faster in some places than others. Uh, I work at a fabulous institution. The reason I'm there is that they are definitely quite in the modern world when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, so I think it's definitely getting better. And what I have come to think recently is that um, people are much more likely to ask that question, I think, which is a really good thing. However, sometimes, and this is absolutely not what I'm accusing you of, I'm just warning anyone who might do this in the future, um, sometimes people think that discussing the issue is a substitute for actually doing something about it. And fundamentally, people know what they need to do. You do unconscious bias change, uh, training, you call people if you see sexism, you create an environment in which everybody feels included and welcome because that makes it better for the men as well as the women. This is about making the system better for humans. And it's not just about women either. There's all kinds of marginalised groups that are not currently represented in science and that matters. And so what I've started to notice is that there is this big hard issue, you know, difficult issue of these groups being underrepresented. But the answer to the question at this point is not really any more to talk about it, it's to do things. So I'd be, I'm, I'm not, you know, talking about it has a, has a place, right? It makes people feel comfortable with the issue, it makes them feel that they're not the only ones that are thinking like this. But fundamentally, it's time to do things to make the system better for humans. I work in a department where the people who leave early to collect their kids from school are the men. It's not just about the women benefiting in some way, the men don't. Um, so what you can all do is you can always ask yourself, if something just happened uh, and you're not sure about it, switch the genders, right? It's a great game to play. And if it feels really weird when you've switched the genders over in your mental image, it was sexism. Say so. Um, there's also there's a wonderful Twitter account called... Um, is it... Um, Ma Man has it all? What is it? Someone remind me. Um, Yes, that's it, thank you. Follow that, it's brilliant, because what it does is it switches everyday situations, and you see how absur absurd they are. So look for it, call people on it nicely, but don't let them get away with it, and make your environment good for humans. It's very, they're hard things to do. Culture change is hard. Listening for humans is hard, even though you've been very quiet for the past hour, thank you. Um, and, and so we know what we need to do. We just need to get on with doing it. So I think that it's improved, but it's improved to the stage where it's time to stop talking. And what bothers me, it's not that I mind the talking, it's that I mind talking as a substitute for doing. And that I'm starting to see that, and that bothers me. But it's getting better. And the best thing is that with, you know, in the world we live in now, there's, it's much more, you don't have to, you, you're exposed to so many people online and on, you know, in various media sources that you don't have to feel isolated anymore. That there's lots of people who, whatever version, of, whatever your version of you is, there'll be people who are similar to you doing that thing and you will be able to find them. So I think that, that adds, you know, it's not as isolating as it used to be because I have worked in labs, you know, when I was a PhD student where I was the only woman and that was just the end of it. Um, and, and that's not the case anymore. So I think there's, there's lots of improvement. Okay, right. I think, I think we have time for one more question. Okay, so make it a happy one. <laughs> um, this is totally unrelated, but... Stop apologising for this. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, who, like, chemist, physicist, bi physicist, biologist, who do you think... Which scientist do you think has had the most positive effect on the world? Oh, good. Let's have a big fight to finish. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, that is an impossible question to answer because all that will happen is my... Whatever I say in my Twitter feed <laughs> will be full, up, full of people I didn't pick. Um, the thing that makes a difference genuinely is those people working together, right? When... Um, uh, and it's not just inside science, it's outside science as well. Whenever I have people ask me to write one of those lists that says, uh, make a list of things you think people who want to be physicists should read. Anything but physics. Like, really, go and find out about the rest of the world. 
Um, and, you know, you do your physics in school and university, that's fine, but make sure you know some languages and some stuff about how the rest of it works. Um, so I, I don't think that one profession has it all, and the, there's a very necessary reason for that, which is that traditionally, so it's the labels are becoming harder now, but traditionally those labels have... have um, described a hierarchy of models of the world. And that's what we're doing in science. We are, there's that thing that all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. And what we want is ways of describing the world that let us do things. And for some things, maths is the appropriate level to describe what's happening. It's a language that we use for everything else. For some things, physics is the appropriate level. You need to follow atoms and think about materials, and, and that's all physics. And that is the appropriate way of solving a problem. For some things, you need the generalizations of chemistry, which don't follow every single electron going everywhere. Um, but that's kind of the next level up, and that is the appropriate model. And then sometimes you need cell theory and biology, and then above that you need social science. So the thing is you need all of them because the world works at all these different levels of detail, and you need separate models for each of those levels of detail. So it's not about them competing with each other. It's about them working together to make sure that what they learn is consistent with all the other models, um, but the, real, the really useful stuff comes from understanding how they fit together. So I'm, I'm going to dodge your question and not make myself exceptionally unpopular with three quarters of the people in the room. <laughs> and I am not going to be Brian and say it's physics, um, because, because I think it's important to understand what science does, and what science does is description. Descriptions that allow us to make predictions. Um, and they, you need different descriptions of different situations. You could, a physicist might you know, have all the quarks in the world, but if you want to understand why your kidneys have just stopped working, not very helpful. So you need a description at the appropriate level. And that's part of the joy of science, is that there are these different perspectives on the same thing, and they are consistent with each other. They have to be, but they all let us do something. And it's being able to do something, which really is... This, this thing about the three life support systems, we need to be able to, to do things in the world, um, as well as having fun and playing with all the toys. And, and so we need the appropriate level, so we do need all the sciences. So that's the nice, uncontroversial way to finish, right? Uh, okay, I think, I think we have to stop now, right? <laughs>